Thank you, Chancellor Wu, for that uh, very comprehensive introduction <laughs> and for the honor of speaking at the 134th graduating class of 2015. It is a great honor. It is an honor that um, was shared by one of my good friends and my former boss, Gene Roddenberry, the creator and uh, producer of Star Trek. But now it is my turn to congratulate the graduating class of 2015. Congra congratulations to you. This is a momentous day. You will now begin a new life with all of the knowledge that you've gathered from your three years here at UC Hastings. And you will be peppered with a host of esoteric legal questions, usually from in uh, emails from distant relatives. <laughs> a lawyer friend of mine told me that um, he uses this vast knowledge that, that he gained from his many years as a law stu uh, student as much as he uses algebra today. The law is strange. At once he tried to explain to me what he referred to as the rule of perpetuities. <laughs> he says it's a rule in uh, property law. It has to do with, he said, fertile octogenarians. <laughs> well, I put a stop to that explanation right there. <laughs> I don't need to know any more about fertile octogenarians that I don't know right now. <laughs> but speaking of octogenarians, one of my personal heroes is Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> now there is a fertile 80 plus mind. <laughs> She terrorizes the barristers at the uh, Supreme Court where, where they uh, gave her a nickname. They call Ruth Bader Ginsburg the notorious RBG. <laughs> and uh, well, during the uh, recent uh, same-sex marriage hearings, she handily eviscerated the argument that same-sex marriage damage society and discourage procreation. Well, she noted that we allow septuagenar septuagenarians who can't procreate to get married. And nothing about giving rights to LGBT people takes anything away from straight couples who already have their rights. The The notorious RBG strikes again. <laughs> it's easy to talk about equality, but it's hard to make it real. And that's why we count on you, the lawyers, whether you become litigators or judges, or whether le you become legislative consultants or politicians. We look to you to safeguard the principles of our Constitution so that we all share equally the terrible burdens of marriage. <laughs> I can see my husband Brad just rolling his eyes. <laughs> but we do look to you for that kind of important leadership because the diploma that you get today will give you entry into that special arena. And in that arena, you will be confronted with very important challenges, complex challenges. And how you deal with those challenges can profoundly affect the life of a person, or a number of people, or a class of people, or 
perhaps even change the course of history. And with that kind of empowerment, you have a responsibility, a grave responsibility, because you belong to another group, the human race. And every member of the human race has within him or her the potential for human fallibilities. Your fallibi fallibilities can become very potent, potent as well. Because I think of an attorney general that we had in California just over 75 years ago. He had the potential for greatness, but he had also the potential for fallibility. Because during his tenure in office, a great war broke out. On December 7th, 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and plunged the world into a second world war. And overnight, a small minority, Japanese Americans, were looked at with suspicion and fear and outright hatred simply because we happened to look like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. This nation was swept up by hysteria. That California Attorney General knew the law. He knew the Constitution. But he also saw that the single most popular political issue in California was the get rid of the Japs and lock him up movement. And this Attorney General became an outspoken leader of that movement. In fact, he made the astonishing statement that because there have been no reports of sabotage, spying, fourth column activity, that is ominous because the Japanese are inscrutable. You don't know what they're planning. And, and this is a quote. He said, there is a studied effort being planned for sabotage. This man who knew the Constitution said the very absence of evidence was evidence enough to indict a whole people. And he ignited an already combustible hysteria that went all the way up to the presidency of the United States and President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which ordered all Japanese Americans on the West Coast to be summarily rounded up with no charges and therefore no trial. The central pillar of our justice system, due process, disappeared. 120,000 Japanese Americans were rounded up and imprisoned in barbed wire U.S. prison camps in some of the most godforsaken places in the country. This California Attorney General became very popular and he was elected governor of California. As a matter of fact, he was elected three times consecutively, a record that was broken only by our current governor, Jerry Brown, who's now serving his fourth term. That three-time governor of California went on to become the chief justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Many of you, I'm sure, have guessed already. That man was Earl Warren, a very powerful man who did great things, but he was also a fallible human being. But ordinary people can also do, do extraordinary things. A year into imprisonment of Japanese Americans as the enemy, the government realized that were, there was a wartime manpower shortage, and they began drafting out of those internment camps. And the astounding, thi astounding thing is, Thousands of young Japanese Americans voluntarily went from behind those barbed wire fences, leaving their families in imprisonment to fight for their country. 
They were put into a segregated all Japanese American unit, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, and sent to the battlefields of Europe. From there, they were sent into the most dangerous missions, and they fought with fierce determination, with extraordinary courage. They sustained the highest combat casualty rate of any unit. And when the war ended, they returned to the United States as the most decorated unit of the entire war. They were welcomed back on the White House lawn by President Truman, who said to them, you fought not only the enemy, but prejudice, and you won. These extraordinary young men are my heroes, and they made the America I have and I enjoy today possible. But there is another group of heroes that came out of those same internment camps. They were the young men who stood up and said, I am an Amer American and I will fight for my country, but I will fight as an American. If I can report to my hometown draft board with my family back home, I will fight for my country, but I will not go as an internee, leaving my family in imprisonment. And for this gutsy, principled, very American stance, they were tried for draft evasion, found guilty, and thrown into federal penitentiaries. And they did hard time as strong, principled Americans. And they are my heroes as well. They were extraordinary people. Ordinary people who did extraordinary deeds. I cherish my American citizenship. I value it highly because I know the high, painful price that has been paid for it. Today is your day of celebration. Celebration of the fact that you will be going out there to meet complex, very difficult challenges. I wish you well. I wish you success and achievement. I wish you to be passionate about the shining ideals of our democracy. I want you to be suc successful with those ideals and to enjoy a fertile octogenarianhood. Congratulations, good luck.